Now, I'm rather confident that every person who's here this morning believes in Christ, has at some time, and perhaps many times, made a conscious decision to ask God in Christ to give you His Holy Spirit, to lead and guide and direct in your life and in your family and with your children and so forth. I, I feel confident that I'm talking to believers this morning. So I'm not trying to convince you that you need to believe in Jesus Christ and you need to surrender yourself and all your concerns to Jesus Christ, who in turn takes our prayers and our needs to His Father. That's the way it works. I want to talk to you about the mystery of the man called Christ Jesus. We live in a, quotes, Christian nation where there are thousands, yea, millions of people who profess to believe Jesus the Christ was sent by God, accepted by God, and gave himself for how many people? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. The persons of God, and I, I hesitate to use persons in, in this discussion, but the persons of God are a mystery. Another word for mystery is enigma. It's there's something puzzling. There's something here that I can't quite get my head around. But I know it's important. And so I, I want to be, I want to remind us of, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, we're not going to turn there, but it reads like this, and Jesus is speaking. I'm telling you this, I'm telling you this, Jesus says, that all sins, A-L-L, -L, all sins that men have committed shall be forgiven them, save one. Oh, we've got to find out what the one is. And there are thousands of different ideas about what the grave sin is. All sins that men, men would be all of humanity in my reading, in my thinking. All the sins that men have committed shall be forgiven them. Shall is which tense? Come on, which tense? Shall. It's future tense. So Jesus is speaking of something that is going to occur in the future from the time that he is here. All sins that men have committed shall be forgiven them, save one. Tell me what the one is. The sin against what? Against the Holy Spirit. Now we've done this, we've shared this, we've said this, we're, let, let's do it again. Why would the sin against the Holy Spirit not be forgiven. Come on, it's simple. Because if the Holy Spirit is not there to touch your heart, to cause you to repent and to call upon God, you don't call upon God. And the Scripture is clear enough, particularly in the New Testament, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be what? What's the word? Shall be saved. The persons, and that's not the best word. I, I've been searching this week for a better word, but I can't find one yet. The persons of God are a mystery, an enigma, a puzzle. And we could say a troubling puzzle. So let me remind you of how many people do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. How many people do not believe that only through Jesus is there salvation for any person down here? So let's, uh, let's kind of outline for a moment the people who do not believe that Jesus was or is a divine being. A divine being. 
according to the New Testament, if Jesus were not divine, he could not be our sin bearer. If he were not divine, he could not die and come back. So who are the people who, well, let's take Jehovah's Witnesses as a group. Some folks say, well, they're not Christian. Well, they, they think they're Christian. Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Jesus was or is a divine person. They believe that he was a good man, but not the Son of God. Well, several million Jews around the world do not believe Jesus was or is divine and do not believe him to be the true and only Son of God. 1.3 billion Muslims on the rock do not believe that Jesus was and is a divine being. How about the Hindus? How about the Buddhists? How about, you know, if we really went around this rock and and took a calculator with us, okay, let's see what how many, very few people on this rock believe Jesus is a divine, was and is a divine being. The Son of God come down from heaven for the express purpose of saving, salving, saving you and me and them. So before we start looking at some specific verses, let's get a get our feet on the ground by saying there are three, and persons is not a comfortable word for me, there are three persons of the Godhead that we want to reference this morning. We're going to spend most of our time considering Jesus the Christ. But we want to talk about the Ancient of Days, the Father. Why don't we turn to John, Gospel of John, in chapter 4. Let's do that. Just, just two or three verses there, three or four. Gospel of John. And you'll recognize right away that the fourth chapter of John is devoted to the experience of the woman at the well. And I think uh, we'll pick this up in verse 17 of John Chapter four. By the way, if you want if you want to expand your personal understanding and study of quotes the Godhead, John is the author that you want to be checking out. The Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation in particular. I'm in verse seventeen of chapter four, Gospel of John. The woman answered, This is the woman at the well. She was a Samaritan. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Because Jesus in a previous verse said, go and bring your husband. I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you've well said, I have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that, you spoke the truth. Now before we go any further, this woman and her experience is a parallel of Mary Magdalene. Okay? This is a Samaritan. This is a worldling person, according to the Jews. Mary Magdalene is a Jew. And uh, they have personal problems. So Jesus said to her, you're speaking the truth. The woman said, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. We're talking about worship. Worship is what you do toward God, and worship is what you do to obtain salvation. Jesus said, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. So who's speaking? Jesus is speaking. And this is one of those tenses. This is a shall tense. This is a future tense. The hour is coming. The day is coming. The moment is coming when you won't worship in Jerusalem or on this mount. Something is going to be different about worship. You worship 
what you do not know, we know what we worship, for salvation is of or from or through the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father. Here is the first person of the Godhead. You're going to worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Verse 24. Now don't let this go in one ear and out the other. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now this is a revelation. I've said several times I'm not comfortable with saying the persons of the Godhead. It, it leads one to think that that person is exactly like us or whatever. Um, to a degree. But the Father, is the Father a Father figure in that we have the male and the Ancient of Days in, in the family? Yes. We're going to worship the Father, Jesus says. Now I have a question for you. Where is Jesus saying you have to worship me? or you will worship me. Let's turn over to chapter 8, Gospel of John, please. Now we could go through 5 and 6, and there's an ongoing feud, and that's not a good word, but there's an ongoing debate taking place, and John is writing about it, chapter after chapter after chapter in the Gospel of John. Jesus is just going from village to village, little town, little burg, walking along, and when they are sick, he reaches down, he heals, he speaks, he touches. And there are those who are following because they are rejoicing that God is working through this person. But there are also those who are following along running ahead, if they can, to the next town or burg. And they are accosting Jesus with words. They are confronting Jesus with words. They are saying, you cannot say that. You cannot do that. You cannot heal on the Sabbath day. You cannot. You, you. So, in verse 21, chapter 8, Jesus said, uh, I'm going away. You will look for me or seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. Now this is the enigma part of this story. Even his own disciples could not understand what he's saying. Where is he going that we can't go? So why don't we pause for a moment and you... Tell me what year, where, where you think he was going that they cannot go. Don't say to heaven. The what? To the grave and back. To the grave and back. Absolutely, because we have a Bible record of some in the Old Testament and some in the New Testament who are taken to heaven. So he's not talking about you can't go to heaven. I'm going away, you will look for me or seek me and die in your sin. And where I'm going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from beneath. I'm from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Now this is rather plain language. Jesus is standing there as a human being in front of these people. And he is saying, I'm not from here. You are. I'm not. I'm from up there. You're from down here. Now, how do you think those Jews responded to that, reacted to that? You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you'll die, you will die in your sins for if you do not believe that... This is the New King James. You may have a King James or another version. If you do not believe that, what? I am. 
Now, these words started a forest fire. Because Jews understand what that title, what, what that's really saying. Then they said to him, Who are you? Jesus said, Just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. See, it's not just the person of Jesus that is a mystery. The person of the Father is also a mystery. Let's, let's just take a moment right here in a little side trip. The title Father, is that male or female? It's male. The title Son, is that male or female? Through the years, I have um, met quite a few persons who say, Oh, that's all right, the Holy Spirit is female. Well, in a few moments, we'll find out that that's not what it says. In chapter 16 of the Gospel of John, Howbeit when He, 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 the Spirit of truth has come, He will guide you into all truth, and He will show you things to come. And it's repeated and repeated and repeated, and it's He and Him and on and on. So the persons of the Godhead are male or female. And I hesitate to use the word persons. <clears throat> male. Now, is God, uh, is God playing with us? Is God showing exclusivity? What, what, why would, if there are at least three members of divinity... Why would God not say, well, here's one? So the answer is in Genesis, the first three chapters. So God made trees and flowers and birds and bees, and then he made, then he made man. And God says, this is the record in Genesis, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, how is this principle of manness or manhood, how is this principle played out in Old Testament Scripture? The male is responsible for the household. He's responsible for the family. He's responsible for protection. He is responsible, responsible, responsible. When the time came that God wanted to multiply man, he had to put Adam to sleep. So we know what Adam was made of, and we know where he came from. God made him, and what material did God use to make Adam? Come on. Dirt. Thank you. When it was time for Eve to come into the picture, what was Eve made of? Thank you. So we're, we're harking back again to the fatherness of Godness. So Eve is out of Adam. What is Jesus out of? What is Jesus out of? When the time came for him to come here as a Savior, what was Jesus out of? He created Himself. There's nothing that was created that He didn't create. He created Himself. My Father, He said over and over and over again. We're also seeing that God is a spirit. The Father is a spirit. Could I say this without being misunderstood? Before Jesus came here and the New Testament was written and the New Testament experiences and Jesus as Messiah, before all of that, I think it is possible that even the family of heaven, the angelic orders and the family of heaven, did not understand the sonness of the Son. 
he was addressed in Old Testament Scripture as Michael the Archangel. Is it possible that God is taking advantage of our circumstances down here to open a window in heaven as well as down here concerning His being, His person, His uniqueness? I think it's not only possible, I believe that's really, if you search the Scriptures in this matter, you will see that the Jews had a great deal of trouble recognizing Jesus. Why? Because he said, My Father, therefore claiming to be a Son of God. And that did not fit their understanding of God because God said to them back there in the Exodus, For the Lord your God is three gods, is that what it says? For the Lord your God is two gods. For the Lord your God is one God. Did this create a problem in the thinking of people who do not believe Jesus is the Son of God? Now let me ask you. No, let's remind you. All sins that men have committed shall be forgiven them, save one. And if you want to talk about what the all sins are, even if you speak a word against God, that will be forgiven you. Even if you speak blasphemy against the Father or the Son, that will be forgiven you. But the sin against the Holy Ghost, there's not forgiveness in this life or in the life to come. There is the Father, He's the Ancient of Days, He's the Almighty One pictured in Scripture as sitting on the throne high and lifted up. You can sin against Him and be forgiven. And then there is one likened to the Son of Man, who is also said to be the Son of God. And He occupies the second position of greatness in the heavenly places. And a sin against Him can be forgiven. But a sin against the Holy Ghost, not in this life or in the life to come. We need to go on here. Uh, I want to go over to chapter 10 in the Gospel of John just to get some verses together here. This is a debate taking place between Jesus and the Jews who are in the crowd taunting him, hurling words and blasphemous statements against him. I'm going to pick this up in verse 7 of uh, John chapter 10. Most assuredly, Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, what? Come on. I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am, verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Verse 11, I am. Now we can go on to verse after verse after verse after verse. Why does Jesus repeat, I am? I had a friend, an Adventist minister, now deceased, but we had uh, several discussions about the Sabbath. He was a Seventh-day Adventist minister, retired. But we were having conversations about the Sabbath. One day he called and he said, uh, you got a few minutes, I want to talk to you. I said, sure. He said, I've been going through the entire New Testament and this Sabbath business. And he said, I want to tell you what I have concluded. I said, okay. He said, it appears to me that Jesus went out of his way to make the Jews angry 
and stir them up over this Sabbath issue. He just, he did things that he knew were calculated to stir them up, to make them mad. And you know what? I had to agree with him. This is a similar situation. We're talking about the Son of the Father. And that is heresy to the Jewish mind. Because God is how many? God is how many? One. Now if we keep reading here in this New Testament, we're going to find this discussion coming to a head. And Jesus finally blurts it out. My father and I are two. What does he say? Come on. My father and I are what? Now here is this enigma business. Here is the mystery. How can God be more than one when there is a clear declaration in Scripture that God is one? And I started out by telling you more than half the people on this rock do not believe Jesus, if He did come, was a divine being. They do not believe He was the Son of God. There is no room in their thinking for more than one God. Unless, of course, you believe in a pantheon of gods and then you can worship mountains and rivers. And Do you understand where we're going here? We're talking about the Son as not only a male figure, but equal to the Father. Is that blasphemy? <laughs> In many places, that's blasphemy. Why don't we go over to chapter 16? Let's, let's just see what the third person looks like, sounds like. This is a prediction on the part of Jesus, a prophecy on the part of Jesus of uh, the outpouring of the early rain that is to come, Pentecost to come. Let's pick it up in verse 12, please. Chapter 16, verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. What's the next word? Now. now. You cannot... You can't handle what I'd like to tell you right now. It's evident if you follow through these several chapters in the Gospel of John. John is just, all he's doing is keeping notes, keeping a record of an ongoing argument and debate. And it went on for days, it went on for weeks, it went on for months. I have many things to say to you, but you're not able to bear them. Not now. However, when He, take note of the He, the maleness, however, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. How much truth? All truth. For He will not speak on His own. The word authority in the New King James is added. He will not speak of it on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will tell you or show you things to come, it says. The Father is pictured as a male figure. The Son is pictured as a male figure. Here the Holy Spirit is pictured as a male figure. Now the Father, the Ancient of Days, is declared to be God. The Son has declared Himself to be one with the Father. That is, that is a bold statement that says, I'm God. And Jesus backs this up by reminding His audience, as the Father Himself has life within Himself, so He has given the Son to have life in Himself. So there seems to be some, some demonstration of authority 
There is the Father, who is one, and there is the Son. And the Son is declared to be the only begotten Son. So let's be reminded for a few minutes of John chapter 3 and Nicodemus. Nicodemus has seen Jesus going from place to place. He's seen miracles. He's listened to Jesus' parables and sermons. And he is under conviction. Now because of his position in the, in the neighborhood, the community, as part of the legal side of Judaism. He comes to Jesus at night. He wants his few witnesses, if any at all, to see him in the company of Jesus. He's not trying to stir up a war. He wants more information about this man. So in John chapter 3, Nicodemus says to Jesus, Master, we know that you are a prophet. We know that you are a teacher sent by God. Now this is an admission that there is something supernatural about the person he's come to see and talk to and question. But he's not ready to say, we know that you are the Son of God. He's going to come under that conviction though. And Jesus tries to explain to him the difference between himself and Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Let me ask you something. Did Jesus ever need to be born again? Did Jesus need to be baptized? No. Did Jesus need to be baptized? Yes. Did Jesus need to be born again? From the grave? Yes. Yes, He is a substitute for us. He is taking our place. So Jesus said, uh, you have to be born again. He said, I don't understand this. This is, uh, this is not familiar talk to me. How can a man enter again the second time into his mother's womb and be born? The answer from Jesus is remarkable. Nicodemus, You've come here with questions. I'm trying to answer you in earthly terms. Being born again, that's an earthly expression. I'm trying to explain to you in earthly terms. And you don't understand. Your mind is not open enough to understand what I'm saying to you. Now, if you can't even understand and accept what I'm saying to you in earthly terms, how will you understand if I speak to you in heavenly terms? I mean, this is, th these conversations are eye-openers. I believe that Nicodemus is a stand-in for you and me. Anybody down here? We have to get to the end of Jesus' life and ministry just before they crucified Him. And He said, I'm going to tell you something, disciples. I'm going to tell you something now. Hear me. The world is not going to end, and I am not going to come until every kindred tongue, nation, and people hears the gospel of the Kingdom. Now wait a minute. How long have Adventists been preaching? A couple of hundred years. How long have Baptists been preaching? About 400. How long have the Catholics been preaching? A couple of thousand. How much progress have we made? In reality, there are more human beings dying on this rock in a year than are accepting Jesus as the Christ on this rock. We have made no progress if we're going to measure by number. Now this is a plain statement from Jesus. I'm not coming back 
you're looking in vain. I'm not coming back until this gospel of the kingdom, this good news that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, ready to come into reality, unless and until this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to how many? Oh. How is God going to reach everybody on this rock? I mean, everyone who has a brain to reason with, because that's what is predicted. I will pour out my spirit on half the population of the world. I will pour out my spirit upon how much? How much flesh? Now tell me what the message is. Tell me what the message is they have to hear. Is it that Jesus is the Son of God? Is it God is one? Tell me what the message is that the whole world has to hear before the kingdom arrives. What he's referring to is the work of the judgment in heaven. That's when the kingdom is voted upon and comes into reality. I am not coming back until I have the crown and the authority to come as king of and lord of. So what are we waiting for? What is it that keeps the world from knowing what needs to be known? What is it? We're waiting for the outpouring of the third person. We're waiting for the Holy Spirit to be granted the commission from heaven and the power and authority from heaven to speak audibly or inaudibly, it doesn't matter, to speak to the hearts and minds of how many people? All flesh. In that day I will pour out my Spirit on how much? How many? All flesh. Is this the context in which Jesus was speaking when He said, I'm telling you all sins that men have committed shall be forgiven them? Yes. God says, I'm not holding your sins against you. I have said to my son, go and take the place and, and bear the sins of the people the many. But there is one choice, one choice, and it will be made when the Holy Spirit is made available to how many people? All flesh. So this is my theory, and I, I will clearly state this is my theory. If you go to the Old Testament, you can find mention of the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God, but it doesn't say the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say the Holy Ghost. The New Testament picture is new and different in that Jesus died, and in dying, He said, I'm giving up my, I'm, I'm giving up my what? My breath, my spirit. I'm yielding it to you. And he gets to heaven shortly there after his resurrection. He gets to heaven. And the first thing his father says to him is, sit down. In other words, there is a work yet to be done, yet to be accomplished. And the end is not going to come until this work is accomplished. Sit down. Now, I don't believe Jesus has been sitting for 2,000 years. I don't mean to imply that or suggest that. I believe that that is a statement of wait in faith. Wait in obedient faith until I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus is not allowed by His Father to make war until God has finished the message to all the world. Does that make sense? And then the cry is heard in heaven, it's finished, it's done. Whoever is righteous, whoever is filthy. So is it possible 
that in the Old Testament we have God, the all-powerful Holy One. You can't even look at Him and live. Is it possible that we come to the middle and there is Jesus who says in one breath, my Father and I are one, but I'm hiding my glory. I'm hiding the light of my majesty and power. I am taking your humanity. I'm taking your flesh so I can die in your place, so I can bear your sins and die in your place. So we have God, and now we have the Son who becomes the focus. The New Testament closes with the focus moving to the Holy Spirit and the outpouring of what we call or refer to as the latter rain. Are you listening? Is there a progressive revelation here? Well, I, I want to just sum this up as simply as I can. I believe that God is one person. But because He is God, because He is divine, He can make Himself to appear, to be, or to even be whatever He wishes to be. I can't do that. You can't do that. When I came into being, I came in the flesh. Jesus did not come into being as a divine being. I was one with you, Father, before the world was. But now I have a family who is sick and dying and I love them and I want to save them and you do too, Father. So I'm asking you I'll surrender all of my titles. I'll surrender all of my power. I will surrender everything that I have. But I don't want to lose my family. So God, is He the Father? Is He the Son? Or is He the Spirit? Yes. Thank you. The answer is yes. God becomes... Look. There's one reference in the book of Revelation. I know you've read it. You've probably not given a great deal of thought to it. But John says, I saw the seven spirits of God which were before the throne. Maybe God can reveal Himself in new and different ways. And maybe He will do that in ages to come. Maybe we have enough revelation to spend the rest of eternity trying to sort out who or what God is and what God has done in the saving of His family. Now I'm going to close with this. I judge you and me to be part of the family of God. But I also judge the angelic orders to be part of the family of God. If you and I as human beings sin, do we need to be saved? Oh, do we ever. If the angelic beings, family, sin, do they need to be saved? As human beings, we waited 4,000 years. We meaning humanity. We waited 4,000 years for Messiah to come. Is it possible the angelic orders have waited whatever thousands of years for Messiah to come. And Messiah would come and He would die. The first death, that's the human death. And the second death, that's the spirit death. Is it possible that there is one name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved? One name, one person, one Savior. We have lots to learn, folk. Lots to unlearn, much to learn. Father in heaven, you love us and you have demonstrated your love in the giving of your Son, the only Son you have. 
You have demonstrated your love for us by saying, I forgive you. And I promise you that in time, through the work and saving ministry of my son, I will make you brand new. I will make you brand new. And the words of Jesus to Nicodemus will come true. How can a man be born again? We thank you for another Sabbath here. We thank you for this little community of believers. We ask for a mighty outpouring of your Holy Spirit. And we will wait, we will wait, we will pray and we will wait until the fulfillment of the latter rain promise. Until then, keep us. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.